Welcome back to Street Signs. International Women's Day looks to create more awareness about discrimination, calling for action on gender equality. The World Economic Forum's latest global gender report says it will take more than 130 years to close the gender gap. United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres says the, the gender equality will in fact take more than twice as long to achieve and warns that women and girls are also being left behind in key sectors, including science and technology. Well, Tanya has been leading our coverage this week and she joins us now with more. Tanya. Thank you so much. And I'd like to welcome our special guest, Juliana on Street Signs, Julia Gillard former Prime Minister of Australia. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Those figures, I mean, how shocked are you by those? Uh, unfortunately, I'm not shocked because I'm familiar with those figures, but we shouldn't ever just get comfortable with them. They should really be a rallying cry as to why we need to do more for gender equality. Unfortunately, I think there's a bit of a sign out there that people are fatigued. You know, we've been talking about this for a long time, so it's easy for people to overestimate the amount of progress that has been made, but we still have a lot to do. No nation on earth has achieved gender equality. Women are still behind in economic empowerment, political empowerment, and in many countries around the world in health and education status as well. Of course, Julia, you broke barriers in your native Australia. And we were just talking, Juliana, previously about your famous speech over 10 years ago. What's changed, do you think, since then? If anything. Yeah, I think some things have changed for the better. I mean, when I was Prime Minister, it was sort of fashionable uh, for the media, for the sort of commentariat to say, you know, she's being treated exactly the same as a man would be treated. And I think the scales have come off our eyes around that now, and we're very knowing about the gendered treatment of women in the public eye. That hasn't happened by accident. It's been pushed by the Me Too movement, by women's activism, and by organisations like the Global Institute for Women's Leadership, which I'm proud to chair here at King's College London. But what's definitely got worse is the underlying social media environment. I mean, social media was becoming a bigger and bigger thing when I was Prime Minister, but it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is now. And we know from all of the research that it's a very toxic environment for women. Well, on that note, how would you describe the evolution of uh, attitudes toward gender equality? There are obviously so many different types of inequality in the world, and it seems as though there is almost a growing resistance to gender equality, given there are other issues that, that some would argue require a, a lot of attention. Yeah, I think you've uh, picked a trend and we can put some figures around this. We'll actually be tomorrow uh, releasing the Global Institute for Women's Leadership in partnership with Ipsos Mori, the very noted global polling company. Uh, we'll be releasing our annual track on attitudes to gender equality. And what that does show is that there are, there's more concern about calling it out, about the backlash you would get if you called it out. Uh, there are more people who think that either gender equality has been achieved or it's even gone too far. And men are the ones that are being discriminated against now. And there are some worrying signs that young people aren't quite as progressive on these issues as you would imagine. I think all of that's telling us there's some toxicity in the environment, some influencers, some figures on social media who are making it their business to appeal to young men, and we need some more research about what that means. And I do think there's this fatigue factor too, so we have to be out there saying, look, there really is more to do, and a gender equal world will be a better world for everyone, for men, for women, for everyone. It means there'll be less stereotypes, more options, more choices. In terms of leadership, Julia, of course, we've seen the recent resignations of Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand and Nicola Sturgeon in Scotland. What do you feel about those? And do you think the pressures of being women leaders got to them? I think the pressure of being a political leader today is intense no matter who you are. I mean, the, the speed of the media cycle, social media, is very corrosive on everybody, I think. That's a sort of warp speed and the speed of good government is much, much slower and leaders get caught in that uh, conundrum day after day. But I do think that there are some special pressures on the shoulders of women. 
uh, women leaders like Jacinda and Nicola, uh, if they ever looked at their social media feeds, and I truly hope they didn't, I truly hope they had staff doing that for them, would have seen death threats, rape threats, you know, every day. Uh, and we only really give women political permission to lead if they manage to bring together a sort of special combination of strength and empathy. The psychological research shows this very clearly. And if they fall one side or the other too strong, we think they're not very likeable. Uh, too empathetic, we think, oh, she's lovely, but she doesn't have the backbone to lead. And I think staying on that tightrope day after day takes quite a lot of emotional labour. And we don't put men on that tight rope. If we see a male leader and he's strong, we say that's good enough. We don't require this empathy as well. A different set of judgments and expectations then. Um, let me come back uh, to what you said about women being scared to speak up. And you're seeing this in the numbers in the survey that you described. Um, that speech that you gave 10 years ago, I'm sure, took a, a tremendous amount of courage. What advice would you give to women who are looking to develop that courage and speak out? Well, I always joke that if you leapt up on the bus or in your uh, coffee room at work and started giving a speech like that, people would look at you a bit <laughs> oddly. There are some things about that speech that are very about the Australian parliamentary culture, which is very hard hitting. Um, but I would say more generally, you know, human beings change things by talking about them. And if we never name it, if we never pull it out for conversation, then it will never be changed. And it's in all of our interests to be doing that together. And for a woman who thinks that she can't do that herself, to look for another woman or a sympathetic man or a group of them who would do it with her. Have you spoken to Tony Abbott since? Oh, look, I've run into him, but we've <laughs> never had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation about that speech, and I wouldn't expect to. <laughs> Jill, I just wanted to ask you, just from your experience, and I'm, just because it's one of our top stories this morning, of course, the reopening of China. In 2013, you had a state visit there with President Xi. What impact do you think their reopening will have on the global economy? Well, I think uh, people have been certainly wanting uh, China to come out of the very strict COVID lockdowns that we saw and to be fully re-engaged. Uh, but the global politics, the geopolitics, is still going to be very complicated. I mean, since the days I was there, I think both China has changed and the US has changed, and that means the nature of the dialogue between them. The public dialogue can be far harsher, far sterner, the words spoken far more hard-hitting uh, than they were back in those days with President Obama. Uh, so I think, you know, we're going to see some ups and downs in global relationships and some things to keep thinking about and things that will impact markets too. And just finally, Julia, what would you like to see the UN government's private sector all doing to close this gap? Yeah, it's going to take all of us. And I would say to everyone, look at your own, you know, backyard first, look at your own organisation, get the statistics, how are women being treated? And I think many will find that at the intake level, lots of women mid-levels starting to lose women and at the top levels not enough women and really be thoughtful about what you can do to change that and then share that best practice, share what you've learned. If we all uh, learn from each other and there is a dynamic about everybody trying to race to do better and better and better, then that will encourage a lot of activism. And just quickly, your role model to many around the world, who was your role model? Well, I didn't um, have the luxury of looking at Australian politics when I was growing up and seeing a lot of women. But by the time I was of university age, uh, a great friend of mine at university, his mother, uh, Joan Kerner, was the first woman to lead the state of Victoria, the first woman premier. And because of my connection with the Kerner family, I got to watch that from the inside. And so she was an incredibly inspiring role model to me. And almost everything that later happened to me happened to Joan first. And I got the opportunity to learn from that. Well, Julia Gillard, thank you so much for joining us this morning on Street Signs. Thank you. A real pleasure. Thank you.